Yes, welcome into Sports Bit. Betting Insight today, Paulie and Teddy, Monday, November 21st. Big game breakdown, Monday night football, the Texans and the Raiders. And we'll get to Thanksgiving, ESPN, LSU, and Texas A&M. And deep dive, we'll recap a wild weekend in college football. That's always the case. Bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books. Let's start in the NFL, where we always start on a Monday. But let's start with the totals, Teddy. 12-2 and two this week to the under. Yeah, and the bad weather has barely even started yet. <laughs> uh, we saw a little bit, a taste of it over the weekend. Uh, all the games with wind uh, stayed under the total. And at least one of the two games that went over. I mean, no shock that the Packers-Redskins went over. But you look at the box score of the Vikings-Cardinals game. That game wasn't supposed to go over the total. Uh, he had a uh, multiple non-offensive TDs in that one. So uh, even the overs, uh, not easy to get there. You know, 12 and 2 to the under. Congrats to anyone that bet a whole bunch of unders this past weekend. I wasn't aware of this until yesterday at William Hill. They have a prop every week on missed extra points. It was three and a half. There were 12 <laughs> missed extra points. You mentioned the weather. The wind was a big factor in these games. And you had, so we'll get to the bad beats, but you had all these missed extra points. I want to see these coaches get creative now and decide, hey, it's not a sure thing. I'm going to go for two. And as, we love it as fans. As betters, we can't stand it. We don't want ram the randomness, Teddy. Well, that's the whole point. I mean, yeah. I, 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 do you really love it as a fan? Do you really love it when your team loses because you missed a 33-yard extra point? You know, or, or wins. And then the other team, I mean, it, it's not – It as a better, you hate it because all it does, it's absolutely unhandicappable. It's completely random. So what does it do? Yeah, right, Paul, you nailed it. It increases the level of randomness in these games. And you'll see situations that I mean, didn't matter in the Redskins game. You know, they went for two and they started chasing it. And they started chasing it. We saw the Steelers do it uh, last week against the Cowboys. One missed two-point conversion or one missed extra point and they're chasing it the whole rest of the way and there's a missed two and then all of a sudden there's a field goal that you just lost and it certainly made a difference in totals this week uh and one that we're going to talk about in a minute yep uh all right bad beats how about the jaguars here we go the lions kick a field goal with 20 seconds left oh uh, i mean that was just brutal brutal if you had jacksonville uh i mean they give up the game they were going to punt. The Lions were going to punt on that last drive. And then the Stafford comes up to the line, and he's barking signals. They're going to call a timeout when the, shot, uh, when the play clock runs down. And what happens? Somebody jumps off sides. Uh, they get the first down. They end up kicking a field goal and covering the spread. Jags plus seven and six and a half plus six. Lions win by seven. And, oh, by the way, the two mixed extra points in that game, the difference in the total. Lands 45, total was 47. Yep, yeah, good call there. Another bad beat, the Rams. This was on Jeff Fisher. This is horrible. 10 nothing. They're pitching a shutout. It's fourth and one from the Dolphins' 30-yard line. He has Todd Gurley. He doesn't go for it. He settles for a 47-yard field goal. Greg the leg misses it. And after getting shut out for most of the game, Miami goes right down the field twice, and they win. Horrible job yeah. by Fisher. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I was shocked. I, you know, I, I was shocked that they tried to kick the field goal. And as soon as the field goal missed, the momentum for that defense was snapped. But it was also penalties. You know, it was stupid penalties. It was bad Greg Williams blitzes. Uh, and there was definitely some not taking the reins off Goff. But that missed field goal changed the whole game. And, and you know, maybe by starting Goff, I, I mean, for an NFL debut, it wasn't real pretty. You know, for any debut, it wasn't real pretty. I mean, they, they didn't take the reins off him all dink and dunk. I don't think he threw a pass longer than five yards until the final drive when they had to, and then he looked completely lost in the backfield. But, you know, uh, maybe Fisher's knocked the Rams out of the playoff chase, which might have served his purpose, since now he has no reason not to play golf the rest of the way. Yes, a bad beat more ways than one. One for Arizona, and the other one for Carson Palmer as the Vikings beat him up. Rhodes with the pick six, and they start the second half with the kickoff return by Patterson. Yeah, I mean, can we call Arizona a bad beat when Carson Palmer gets hit 23 times? Look at the tweet. Or from Sam Monson. It's the most time any quarterback has been pressured so far in the 2016 season by percentage. First quarterback to be pressured on more than 60% of his dropbacks over the course of the game. Carson Palmer took an absolute beating in that game. And yet, you still got to call it a bad beat. Whenever you have a 100-yard pick six, where at a minimum it's a 10-point swing, and it looked like it was going to be a 14-point swing. That's a 14-point turnaround. And then you have the kick return touchdown open the second half. You lose by less than a TD. Uh, I mean, the Vikings scored 30 points on 217 total yards, less than four yards per play. 
tough beat if you had Arizona. Yeah, I had Arizona. Yeah, man. And the Browns, again, they lose. They're in this game late. And then a defensive touchdown, Kessler was knocked out of the game. Oh, yeah. McCown forced into action after Kessler gets out. And a fumble six deep in his own territory. Three minutes left. Steelers get the cover. Pittsburgh wasn't going to score on offense. They get the cover on defense. And not that many people bet Cleveland. If you had Cleveland plus eight, plus eight and a half, plus nine, you really didn't like that final stanza. Bad bet. The t- plenty of Titans money. Heavy, heavy Titans money. They fall behind 21 to nothing. They've lost 11 in a row to the Colts. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you what. I give Tennessee credit for coming back in that game because Indy came out of the bye. They were ready. They scored touchdowns their first three possessions. The Titans secondary got roasted. Tennessee played well enough to make things interesting. A couple mistakes cost them the contest. And yeah, what's it now? 11 in a row for Indy over Tennessee. Titans ain't going to win that division unless they can get past the Colts. Yes, and bad for the books. More missed extra points. Nugent misses two for the Bengals. Yeah, he sure did. And, of course, the fact that he missed two after the Bills took a ton of money. They were bet down to plus two. So Nugent cost him the game because they were down four at the end of the game instead of being down two at the end of the game, and they would have kicked a field goal instead of having to go for the touchdown. So that was uh, the bad for the books. And Nugent and the missed extra point barrage really was a, an absolute difference maker in that one. Not that he would have made the field goal necessarily if he was missed extra point, but uh, yeah, uh, it, the the one missed extra point led to it. Not it didn't lead to another, but the two missed extra points made the difference between being down by two at the end of the game, and being down by four when they were in field goal range. Yeah, looks like AJ Green could be done for the season too. Oh yeah, I mean Andy Dalton was not good without Green. You know they went three and out on four of their first five second half drives, only 23 yards in the fifth. Tyler Boyd made a couple of catches, but he can't fill A.J. Green's shoes. No one can fill A.J. Green's shoes. Yes, and two more bad for the books. A lot of Tampa Bay money. They go into Kansas City and win, and fiddle in the middle. The Gronk news came out. New England was sitting there at 13.5 or 14, went off at 10.5 or 11. Another big missed extra point by Gostowski, and it lands in the middle. Yeah, it sure did. I mean, the the, the books that catered to sharp betters did not like that Tampa win at Kansas City. That was all sharp money. And the Chiefs have gone 17-3 and in their previous 20 regular season games. I don't know that they're good enough to maintain that level of play. But Alex Smith with the end zone interception, that was a big difference in that ball game. He's usually one of the best at avoiding those kind of mistakes. And for the Pats, I mean, the, this was a situation where the money moved the line when Gronk was announced out. Boom. You know, they, they readjusted. So it wasn't a true fiddle in the middle, but certainly not a great result for the house. All the public money came on New England. And they weren't laying 13 and a half and 14 like it was earlier in the week. All right, up next, big game breakdown. Monday night football, the first place Raiders. And we'll get to the Thanksgiving games. We'll start with LSU and Texas A&M. we got a big week of shows coming up as it really gets interesting in college football, which we'll hit on in the deep dive on SportsBit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Go to SBRodds.com. Browse, compare, and shop live odds available at top online sportsbooks. We're back on Sports Bit. Betty and Insight today. Paulie and Teddy. Big game breakdown. As always, live on sportsbookreview.com. Monday night football. Houston and the Raiders. Raiders 6, 45 the total. Azteca Stadium, 7,400 feet. More than 2,000 feet above Denver. Great for punters and place kickers. Janikowski could probably hit from 65 easy if they want to try it. But neither traveled in until Sunday night to get acclimated. And Houston did play at Denver earlier in the season with the elevation, but they were beat 27-9, so maybe they didn't learn anything. Donald Penn, left tackle for the Raiders. Good quote, played college ball at Utah State, 4,500 feet. I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat it. It's going to be rough. The thing is, whenever that second win hits, then you're good. But you hope that second win hits early. It's an interesting handicap, Teddy. It is. Did you see where the locker rooms are for this game? Yeah, the wild. <laughs> yeah, they were built just for the game. They're out in the parking lot. So basically, essentially, the team's going to have to climb up through the stands and outside the stadium to reach their lockers after pregame warm-ups and at halftime. So, I mean, again, when you talk about randomness, and we like less randomness in this situation, there's clearly uh, more randomness. And look, the Raiders went into the bye. They were red hot. 7-2. and two, They had three straight wins. And in general... I like teams coming out of the bye off a loss or a couple of losses, not off of three straight wins. Those teams tend to come out and play like their hair is on fire. Sometimes the three straight win teams, a little bit fat and happy, and they come out and have a real momentum killer. 
think no further than the Minnesota Vikings earlier this season. Then you get the quote from Khalil Mack, quote, it's easy when you got a group like this. And of course, Khalil Mack is a real leader on that team, on and off the field. It's easy when you got a group like this. Everybody's focused. Everybody's ready to keep the pedal to the metal and keep winning. That's what it's all about. I'm glad we have a focused group like this. And, you know, when you think about this Raiders team, they're still allowing 6.4 yards per play. That's dead last in the NFL. But they had three consecutive strong games in a row before the buys. So you say, what are the markets not seeing clearly? What are the markets, what's lying? The Raiders' overall defensive stats are lying right now. They're still dead last in the NFL, but they're playing better than the numbers are going to show. Yes, Houston comes in at 6-3, and 5-0 and at home, 1-3 and three on the road. They're 6-3. and three. They've been outscored by 27 points. They have one of the best weapons in the game in Hopkins, but they can't get him the ball. You look at this graphic, as yards per catch, 2013 through 15, 14.2. This year, 10.7. Osweiler is 31st in passer rating, only ahead of Gabbard and Fitzpatrick. I, I think, you know, I, I think a big part of this, though, Teddy is scheme. They aren't taking any chances, especially when they're on the road. Well, there's another part of it, too, and that's Will Fuller. Because remember, it's supposed to be Hopkins on the one side, Fuller's a speedster. He's a game-breaker. He's a number one pick. He's been banged up in and out of the lineup. Hasn't really been the factor they thought he was going to be one of a number of Houston Texans. And key players, talking like Vince Wilfork on the defensive line and, and Fuller, there's a handful of others who are listed as questionable tonight. This is one of those games you definitely want to check the injury report in the hours up leading up until kickoff. Uh, but see the Osweiler quote. You know, in every game plan, we try to get the ball to hop. He's our number one receiver, and that's what you do in the NFL. You try to find, way, five, find ways to scheme plays to get the ball to your number one wide receiver, as well as your other guys. But there's a million different ways you can win games in this league. I think we proved that Sunday. We proved that throughout the year. We've won in different ways, so I'm not going to say we have to get this guy going or this guy needs more touches. At this time of the year, the keys to winning games are running the ball, protecting the ball, playing great defense and special teams. Honestly, I agree with Osweiler. At the same time, at this time of year, the keys to winning games are getting something out of your damn quarterback. There's a reason that John Elway didn't pay Brock Osweiler the money and went with Trevor Simeon at a much cheaper price. Osweiler so far has not been worth his $72 million contract. But the Raiders, Paulie, the Raiders, not an easy team to lay points with. They've been winning games. They have not been winning games by margin. Well, unique, uh, unique scenario, too, because even though it's in Mexico City, it is a home game for the Raiders where they're going to have most of the fans. So you know, I, I, That is true. I mean, in terms of the, 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 there's a decent fan base in the Texans. I'm interested to see that. I know the Raiders tend uh, to have a larger fan base in uh, areas outside of Oakland than most teams, but I'm not convinced it's going to be all Raider fans there. All right, game number two, live on sportsbookreview.com, Thanksgiving night on ESPN. LSU, Texas A&M. LSU is five and a half on the road, no total yet. LSU has four losses, and all four losses, they've held their opponents under 20 points in every game, Again, in each loss. Again, it goes back to the offense and the issues, and they had Florida beat. They had ball inside the three-yard line late. Couldn't cash in. They also had first and goal, and they had a big turnover. And then Florida and with the 98-yard touchdown. Well, they had first and goal five times and came 10 points and finished with the game oh, with 10 oh, points. Oh. You know, and the final play. We got to talk about this final yeah. play because LSU gets the look they wanted. Supposed to be an easy pitch to Darius Geis around the left end, but the running back ran the wrong way. Who do you blame for that? I blame the coach. That is coaching. Big-time college football jobs get determined on plays like that. An ordering great recruiter. He fires guys up. But you know what? <laughs> you got to do the X's and O's. And, uh, you know, why was he in the game? Well, I mean, Leonard Fournette had the ankle injury. He wasn't going to play. And the team's got in the pregame skirmish when Fournette was only dressed in sweats. And after they mixed it up, he wanted to play Orgeron. Leonard wanted to play. He struggled all week in practice. He came to me right before the game and said, Coach, I want to play. But he wasn't effective. Just 40 yards on 12 carries. And then Geis struggled in the red zone. He had the fumble on the first and goal in the second quarter. Went the wrong way on the final play. He's the GOAT. Obviously had a rough game. You blame the kid. Yeah, you know what? He's a kid. I blame the coach for not having him coached up, knowing where to go. Definitely a scheduling edge to A&M. While LSU was battling it out at home and lost a tough game to Florida, A&M was playing Texas-San Antonio at home. And it certainly helps on a short week. 
The pass rush among the best in the country, but the weakness has been when teams just line up and run at them. Bama had 287 on the ground. Miss State had 365, so they struggle in these physical matchups against LSU. 0-4 straight up in ATS against LSU under Sumlin. I, I still think he's on the hot seat, probably survives, and who knows what LSU's going to do. Can, can you say this will determine if Orgeron comes back? Uh, I, 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 I don't know if Orgeron survives last week. You know, uh, I mean, Miles Garrett, what, he had four and a half sacks in the win over UTSA and a much easier game compared to the physical, intense battle that LSU played. Of course, in a short week, that could matter. But you talked about it. Texas A&M, 0-4 straight up, 0-4 against the spread versus LSU under someone. And when you look at that LSU defense, that, again, every week, every single week, they're shutting teams down. If you can line up and run the football against A&M, LSU can beat AM. I think we'll get back to this game when it comes to play of the day. Yeah. And the race is on for Tom Herman with the Texas rumors. And you know, LSU <laughs> wants them. Which so it's which is I mean, we we're not we're not gonna talk about this in a minute, so give me one moment to be on a soapbox here. Yeah. Remember, after Tom Herman lost one game, the SMU game, nobody wanted him. Yeah. And then he wins one game and now he's a great coach again. <laughs> it's it's insane what goes on with the with what, the boosters and how impatient they are and how one game determines everything for these guys. If you like a guy, let him build a program. If you don't want him, don't hire him. Deep dive up next, college football. Bad beats, bad <laughs> bets, bad for the books. And the play of the day on Sportsbit. Betty and Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Research before you bet. Be sure to check out SBR Picks for the best game predictions, breakdowns, and much, much more. All right, time for the deep dive. College football now. These big moves got clobbered over the weekend. Let's start with Illinois. Bet from 11.5 down to plus 8. Shut out against Iowa, and they made history. Illinois never kicked off. Iowa took the win both times. They kicked off to Illinois. Their first 10 possessions, they punted. Illinois, Illinois then went interception and downs. So the Illini never kick off, and they get shut out? Yeah, yeah. Wes Lunt came back. That's why, you know, they said, oh, you got the quarterback back. They're gonna, that's what all the Illinois money was about in that ballgame. All of it. Wrong money. But that wasn't the only bad bet. There was a whole bunch of bad bets on Saturday. Oklahoma, West Virginia. What about that total? Got bet from 67.5 to 62.5. Wind and snow. It didn't bother the Oklahoma ground game. Uh, you know, Perrine and Mixon both on the way to the NFL. Game finishes with 84 points. And the, all the money on the under. Dead wrong. Bad bets. San Diego State, Wyoming under. Bet from 59 down to 53.5. 67 points scored. San Diego State returns the opening kickoff for a touchdown. Another one later in the game, and they get a Hail Mary at the end. To, to, they thought they were going to tie and go to overtime. But Rocky Long is a 10-point favorite, goes for two in the win. They don't get it. Wyoming wins. I like the concept, though. I'm never going to complain about a coach going for two and avoiding overtime. Overtime is completely random. If you think you have a team backed up on their heels, no problem. Go for the two-point conversion, especially at the end of the game when you got a tired defense. What about UMass? They took a ton of money over BYU, plus 31 down to plus 27 and a half. They're on their way out to Hawaii. The Minutemen didn't care. They got a 70-yard touchdown, missed extra point for the first score of the game. And the rest of the way, outscored 51 to 3. BYU just laid a physical beating on that team. Who was betting Baylor? Why were they doing that? Freshman quarterback, the team has quit. They were plus two and a half. They went off the favorite in that one. They lost by three touchdowns at home to Kansas State. It was a ton of Baylor money. They were plus two and a half to minus two and a half. And there were so many bad attitude games for the Bears in that uh, place. For the, you know, and I call them bad attitude plays. You know, where a guy doesn't run his route out. He didn't run his route out of the end zone. It cost him a touchdown and they got inter intercepted. That type of thing happened over and over. The FSU Syracuse game, Florida State from 60 and a half bet up to 66 and a half. That orange uh, running completely different on offense without Eric Dungy at quarterback. Bad move towards the over. Yeah, here's another one. Arizona quit on Rich Rod weeks ago. They were plus seven, bet down to plus three in Corvallis against the Beavers. They lost 42 to 17. And why in the world was TCU favored against Oklahoma State? They scored six points. They weren't just favored. They took a ton of money. It went TCU minus four to minus six and a half. And that was all wise guy money, the sharp money, you know, uh, big game day money to the Horned Frogs. And all of it was wrong. The squares beat the crap out of the Sharps on that one. All Joes over the pros. Yes, we talked about this on Thursday's show. Look out for the weather. And boy, it came in in the Midwest. Bad for the books. Michigan State and the under. And Indiana 
and the under. It was a blizzard in Ann Arbor and 40 mile, 20, 30 mile an hour winds in East Lansing. Yeah, I mean, both of those games, there was no sweat. Underdog and under, underdog and under from the opening possession of the game. Uh, that was both the underdogs and the unders. Bad for the books. Most books took parlay money on the duo. Did not work out particularly well for them. And then there's a the Colorado game that we cashed a ticket with here uh, on Sportsbit. That got bet all the way up. We said Washington State, they might not go all out. And I'm surprised. The Cougs played well. The Buffs played really well down the stretch, though. Colorado from minus 3.5 all the way up to minus 6. They win the game by two touchdowns. Um, that was a nice one. That was a nice result for the house. And Mike McIntyre looked pretty happy after the game. Check out that picture. Yes, he's doing an excellent job. Coach, Coach of the year, of the no year. doubt. And they turn, they get right around, they get Utah coming up, trying to get in the Pac-12 title game. And USC again, Teddy. Uh, a ton of steam there. 10, bet up from 10 to 13 and a half, and they crush USC. Uh, and, UCLA, you know, UCLA. Yeah, and, and here's the truth of it is that I – <laughs> the, the Trojan under parlay has now cashed five straight weeks. I stepped in front of USC this week. I thought that I'd stepped in front of them last week against Washington. I'm like, ah, okay, this is the week. Am I, am I dumb or dumber? Uh, not a smart bet. Wrong. <laughs> USC looked like the number two team in the country. Remember how badly Alabama beat them? You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, so I mean, embarrassing. It was a, a, embarrassing. It was a, embarrassing. i like to see a rematch between those two teams. Right now, USC looks like the second best team in the country. Well, I'll agree with you there. Uh, it begs the question, what were, what were they watching in practice, though? I know Brown was highly touted. It's night and day with Darnold. <laughs> it really is. Uh, uh, he's, he's been really impressive. Um, that's all I got. I mean, he's uh, really impressive. What do you say? Uh, what were they watching in practice? They were watching the number one QB recruit uh, in the nation um, <laughs> and giving him his chance. And the non-number one QB recruit in the nation got his uh, – Got his chance, and he's been the better of the two. Darnold's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yep. You have any interest in the uh, the future odds now, the updated odds, golf odds, Jeff Sherman at the Westgate here in Las Vegas, Superbook, Alabama. We can put that up. Alabama 5-7. to seven. Uh, Ohio State 2-1. to one. There's Clemson, Michigan. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know what the hell's going to happen. I mean, in terms of what they do now with Washington, if they win the Pac-12, will they take two from the Big Ten? They, get, they catch a break with Louisville getting beat. I don't know what they're going to do. No, me neither. Uh, again, these odds, let's call them what they are. They're for entertainment purposes only. The sharp money does not bet these type of wagers without a significant overlay. I don't see one in these numbers. All right, here we go. Money time. Play of the day. Oh, sh- oh show up. Very important. Show update. So three shows this week. Nothing uh, Thursday and Friday. We're taking off Thanksgiving and the day after. Crazy with all the games. We are doing three jam-packed shows uh, long shows coming up the next couple days too as we fit all the games in and a great schedule with the Apple Cut, uh, Michigan, Ohio State, and all the NFL games. We'll go over all the Thanksgiving games as well. So a big week of shows coming up, even though we'll be off Thursday and Friday. 25-14 and 14 run, 31-17-1 and one on the football season. Back to Thanksgiving. What are we doing, Teddy? Yeah, well, let, let me just say one thing about tomorrow's show uh, and Wednesday's show. Tomorrow's show, we're going to do all the games Thursday and Friday. And then Wednesday's show will preview the games for the weekend. So you'll get your standard big game breakdowns. I'm just going to have two packed shows for you. That way, Paulie and I can get a couple of days off. Play of the day. Let's go to Thanksgiving Day. Number 113, LSU minus 5.5. Don't bet this yet. There's a decent chance that this line gets bet down a little bit based on the leading indicator shops. That being said, we will grade ourselves on this 5.5 number. This is a chance for Leonard Fournette. Uh, redemption time for Fournette and LSU. They're going to go hard for that father figure, Ed Orgeron, one more time. Take the Tigers minus the points on Thanksgiving night. LSU minus five and a half. That's the play of the day. Yes, very good. It was one of the best weeks in college football and the NFL. We'll run it all down coming up tomorrow. And Jimmy Vaccaro with the deep dive to go over how the books did and the players. It's coming up then. We'll talk to you on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com.